Hi everyone. For those of you who do not already know me, my name is Ms. Carroll and I'm a Drexel University graduate student working with Dr. Cavallo as I finish my MSN. I will be the guest lecturer for this informational presentation on cleft lip and cleft palate. The objectives for this lecture are to describe the key elements in performing a health history and physical exam on a cleft lip, cleft palate patient, identify nursing diagnoses associated with cleft lip and palate, and to discuss the nursing management for the pre-op and post-op cleft lip and cleft palate patient. Cleft lip and cleft palate occurs in 1 in 700 births worldwide. My hospital alone delivers more than three times this amount of babies in a year, so you can imagine that this is a pretty commonly occurring malformation. It often occurs with other anomalies, most commonly heart defects, ear, ear malformations, skeletal deformities, and genitourinary abnormalities. It has been identified in over 350 syndromes and is thought to be caused by a combination of genetic and environmental factors. So when does it occur? Your textbook tells us that lip tissue fit, fuses by five to six weeks gestation and the palate fuses by seven to nine weeks. So these variations occur early in pregnancy when environmental triggers are thought to be introduced. Cleft lip may occur alone, but 50% of cases occur with cleft palate as well. Infants with cleft lip and palate are often managed by a team consisting of a plastic surgeon or craniofacial specialist an oral surgeon, a dentist or an orthodontist, a prosthodontist, a psychologist, an otolaryngologist or ENT as we often call them, a nurse, a social worker, an audiologist, and a speech language pathologist. According to your textbook, surgical repair of the lip often occurs around, occurs around two to three months of life and the palate is repaired between nine to 18 months of life. Complications in this patient include feeding difficulties, altered dentition, delayed or altered speech development, and otitis media, which may lead to temporary or permanent hearing loss. Your nursing assessment will include a history. You'll want to ask the infant's mother about risk factors, including smoking during pregnancy, prenatal infection, advanced maternal age, and the use of anticonvulsants, steroids, and other medications during early pregnancy. Follow-up visits should include inquiry about feeding difficulties, respiratory difficulties, speech development, and otitis media. In your physical exam, sorry, in your physical exam you'll want to observe the appearance of the cleft lip and the palate. Does it affect the lip only? The lip into the nostril? Is it unilateral or bilateral? Does the cleft affect the hard palate or the soft palate or both? You'll want to palpate the palate with a gloved finger to inspect for a mild cleft that may not be easily visualized. <clears throat> I wanted to include this slide here so that you could see how different cleft lip and cleft palate cases can be and how each may affect the patient a little differently depending on what structures are involved and how large the cleft is. You may pause the lecture to read over the descriptions if you'd like. I just want to add that the alveolar ridge, for those of you who may not know, is the hard part of the infant's gums that is later replaced by teeth. Laboratory and diagnostic tests for cleft lip and palate are minimal. It may be diagnosed prenatally on ultrasound or after birth on, upon visual inspection or palpation. A genetic workup or labs may be ordered if other anomalies are present. Pre-op labs may be ordered, though there is usually minimal blood loss during the repairs. Nursing diagnoses, our favorite, right? Nursing diagnoses for the patient with cleft lip and cleft palate include risk for fluid volume deficit. This is because the infant cannot form an adequate seal around the nipple and therefore will not have a strong suck. These babies usually wind up biting down on the nipple with the intact portion of their gums, or using a combination of sucking and chewing to expel milk from the bottle. Imbalanced nutrition, less than body requirements. The rationale for this diagnosis is the same as the last one. Risk for aspiration. Your textbook doesn't mention this diagnosis directly, but when you think about the fact that babies are obligatory nose breathers, 
and a cleft palate creates an opening from the mouth to the nose, they're very much at risk for aspiration of their oral secretions, and particularly the formula or breast milk they're attempting to drink. Caregiver role strain or risk for it. These infants take a long time and some skill to feed, so parents may feel that feedings cannot be delegated to others. The infant also requires close follow-up with several providers, as mentioned in the beginning of this lecture, and usually requires more than one surgical procedure to repair the clefts. Body image disturbance. So surgeons these days do a phenomenal job at repairing cleft lips and palates but the child may still zero in on their scar or a slight asymmetry to their lips and their face. And if you happen to work in an area stricken by poverty or with a family who is impoverished, the family may not have been able to afford a repair. And so you can imagine that child is at very high risk for disturbed body image. After preparing this lecture, I thought of at least one or two more diagnoses not listed on the care plan in your book that could also apply. The next section is an activity that asks you to provide one more nursing diagnosis for the patient with cleft lip and palate and your rationale for choosing it. Your pre-op nursing management will include supporting the parents and the family. You should do this by encouraging parent bonding, acknowledging feelings surrounding the presence of the clefts, supporting the parents and caring for the infant, particularly with feedings, and providing education regarding the eventual surgical repairs and restoration of the child's appearance. You will want to monitor the intake and output in the newborn period and determine if the infant is meeting fluid requirements and monitor growth at follow-up visits. Special de feeding devices are often needed for infants with cleft lip and palate and you should evaluate the infant's av ability to use these devices and educate parents on their use. Some of these special feeding devices include the Mead Johnson bottle, which is pliable, allowing the parents to gently squeeze the milk into the infant's mouth as he or she eats. The Haberman bottle is a similar concept, except that the parent gently compresses a long nipple as the infant sucks. The pigeon nipple has a hard side with an air vent that points up towards the nose and the hard palate, and a soft side that rests against the tongue for the infant to compress. The curved nook nipple is supposed to seal the cleft palate as it presses against it while allowing the infant to suck or chew from the nipple. Dr. Browns also makes a specialty system with a one-way valve to ensure forward flow of milk and the system can be com combined with nipples of varying flow rates or the Y-cut nipple which only flows when it is compressed. A supplemental nursing system which helps infants Sorry, I lost my place. <laughs> Helps infants to latch to the breast while ensuring that they receive adequate nutrition. As Dr. Cavella mentioned in your respiratory and cardiac lecture, it is important to reiterate that nipples should never be cut to help the infant eat better. There are many, many commercially available nipples available that are safer and provide a standardized flow for the infant with every feed. Infants should be fed in a semi-upright position with the head at a 30 to 45 degree angle to reduce the risk of aspiration. These babies also require more frequent burping as they tend to swallow more air during their feeds. Some infants may not receive adequate intake through any of these methods and may require a G-tube in order to maintain their daily caloric intake. You should also use specialty devices or prosthetic devices as ordered and instruct the parents on how and when to use these devices. <clears throat> a nasoalveolar molding device, also called a NAN, may be used to bring the gum and the lip together prior to surgery. It may include nasal stents within the device to help mold nasal cartilage. A prosthodontic device can be made to create a false palate and prevent milk from being aspirated through the nasal cavity while the infant feeds until the repair is complete. This photo is just demonstrating the elevation of the head during a feed as opposed to almost flat or supine position. So we normally feed babies like this, but we need to elevate that head more. In reality, some infants with cleft palate do better eating in the same position, but with their left side facing down because gravity directs milk towards the side of the mouth and the throat and away from the cleft in the center.
These are photos of some of the special bottles and nipples used for cleft lip and palate infants. You can see that the plastic of the Mead Johnson bottle appears softer and more pliable so that parents can squeeze the milk out. And also the Haberman feeder, which has a longer nipple for parents to push on or gently squeeze in the same way. These are photos of infants breastfeeding with a supplemental nursing system in place. You can see the container full of milk with the tube attached that is secured near the nipple so that the infant can receive more milk with less work while breastfeeding. The NAM device can be simplistic, as you can see in the first picture, or more complex depending on the extent of the cleft and the amount of molding needed, as the other photos depict. This device is removed during feedings. This photo shows you some of the prosthetic devices that can be worn during feedings to prevent aspiration. They look a lot like a retainer if any of you have ever owned one, but the idea is to seal over the cleft so that milk does not enter the nasal cavity. This slide relates to your next activity. I want you to think about how you would feed this infant with an unrepaired wide cleft palate and no prosthesis to cover the opening. What technique might you use that was not already mentioned in this lecture? Postoperatively, you want to keep the infant from rubbing the facial or palatal sutures. This means using the supine position until the lip is healed and arm restraints to prevent the infant from touching the face or inserting items into the mouth. Restraints should be removed one at a time every two hours for 10 to 15 minutes. The suture line and any pr protective devices should be cleaned as per the surgeon's instructions. Petroleum jelly may be ordered to the external suture line. You never want to put that inside the mouth. Dressings and devices should be used and maintained as instructed. Steri strips may have been placed over the sutures and should be left in place until they fall off. Or a metal bar called a Logan's bow may have been placed. Both are designed to prevent tension or pulling on the sutures. So essentially they kind of keep the lip in a little bit of a flex position to keep from pulling. Nasal stents may be used for several days up to a year to help shape the cartilage of the nose following a cleft lip repair and also to maintain patency of the nares. They may be sutured or taped to the face, and they are usually removed several days to weeks uh, post-op for cleaning and for feedings. Again, the NAM device may be used post-op to aid in molding of the tissues. Assess the surgical site for bleeding, drainage, or redness. Note if the sutures are intact and if the edges of the wound are approximated. You should manage the post-op infant's pain with meds as ordered and non-pharmacological techniques. Try to avoid having this infant cry vigorously or for prolonged periods because crying will place tension on the sutures. You can do this by managing pain, providing comfort measures like cuddling and rocking, and anticipating the infant's needs such as diapering and feedings. Ensure that items that may disturb, disturb the palatal sutures are not placed in the mouth. This would include spoons, suction catheters, pacifiers, plastic syringes, fingers. Basically, you don't want to put anything in that baby's mouth. When ordered to do so, you will feed the status post cleft palate repair infant using a special device like a rubber or silicone tip syringe. Infants who are status post cleft lip repair can often still suck from a nipple, and usually they're able to do so more easily. These pictures show the use of arm restraints. In the top left picture, you can see the use of the special syringe to feed the infant following a palate repair. And in the bottom right picture, you can also see that this infant is wearing his NAM device. These pictures show the use of a Logan's bow after a cleft lip repair to prevent tension on the lip and the sutures. These infants are wearing nasal stents to mold their nares. You can see the various ways that stents are secured, but the device is still providing the same effect. Infants can breathe with these in, but the stent is usually removed for feedings if not sutured in place. To wrap up, we have our Healthy People 2020 objective, which is to increase the number of states with a referral system for cleft lip and cleft palate patients to rehabilitative teams. 
As nurses, it is our job to ensure that we refer our patients to these teams or advocate for a system in which patients can be referred. These are some before and after photos of infants who have had their clefts repaired. For smaller clefts, the lip and palate may be repaired at the same time or with one surgery each. And for larger clefts with more extensive tissue involvement, mul multiple surgeries may be needed, and a palate revision may be needed as the child grows. That is all. Thank you.